Oh, that. Amen. Thank you, Sister Nadine. Whatever you did, it worked. Um, the kingdom of God will, will be pure and holy. That is why the Bible speaks so much about holy living. And we better practice from now because according to Revelation chapter 19, if we don't live holy, we're going to be naked at the judgment seat of Christ and nakedness won't work. You remember what happened to the man that went to the wedding feast in Matthew 22? He was an invited guest. Sir. When the Lord of the feast came out, he didn't say, you, sir, who are you? He said, friend, how come you come without your wedding garment? The wedding garment was the deciding factor. And I want to say to all of us, including myself, all of us, let us strive to make sure that we are properly clothed. And the clothing is the righteousness according to the King James Version, but in accurate translation, the righteous acts of the saints. Thank you, sir. Most welcome. And folks, remember, when I try to answer, and I know I'm giving you references and other inferences to help us to understand, but if it's not clear, don't be afraid to tell me that it's not clear to you because we are all here to learn. And I want to make sure it's my responsibility to do the best I can by the grace of God so that it's clear enough that you understand. I turn something off? I'm hearing nothing. If you're hearing me. I'm hearing you. Okay, good. Thank you. Dr. Clark, are you there? Yeah, yes, I'm here. You can hear me? Huh? We can hear you, but it echoes, echoes. I think Dr. Clark, Mike is going in and out. I'm hearing, been hearing him. What about now? Yeah, I'm hearing you now. You can hear me now? Loud and clear. All right. So, turn. you have to turn it down. You still have a little, echo. You still have a little feedback. Yeah, all right. What about now? Good. All right. Anyone with a question? Anyone with a question for Pastor William? You know, we're having some challenges. We don't know why, but... That's the way it is. Amen. Praise the Lord. Satan is disagreeing with something. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. Um, Pastor, I have a question. For Go right Pastor. ahead. Go right ahead. Um, so last week after the lesson, um, someone had a question as far as um, us being in the dispensation of grace at this present time. And I want to kind of tie that to the lessons that we've been doing on, about worship and with um, Nadab and Abihu and then also with the two when the ark was being transported and they reached out their hand. When Nadab and Abihu um, sent up strange incense or fire to, to the Lord um, as an act of worship, after that, Aaron was um, basically prohibited or prevented from actually mourning them. And I know it's because what they did was an act of disobedience. Um, but I'm wondering, is that because at that time we, they weren't in a dispensation of grace? So they were immediately judged as opposed to us who are in a dispensation of grace will be judged God has given us an opportunity to repent daily 
so that our judgment comes later on. You know, the Bible speaks about judgment begins first at the house of God. House of God meaning God's people. And I am a little nervous. I'm a little nervous to carry the idea that God judges us with a lighter hand than he judged the Old Testament sin. And I don't really believe that is true. When you read the Old Testament, you realize that God does not judge anybody without knowledge. Usually he informs them first. And so the Lord informs us. The difference is, the difference is, the Lord spoke to his people, our brother Israel, through prophets and later on through apostles. But that's where the church began. Now he speaks to us through his son. So one of the reasons why it appeared to us as if his hand is a little lighter than on us, than on our brother, the Old Testament saints, it's because we have the word of God with us all the time. You see, they had to wait until the prophet, Dave, for example, David had to wait until Nathan come. When we do our thing, we don't have to wait until Nathan come. First of all, the Holy Spirit convicts us. And we have the Lord Jesus Christ in written form in front of us almost all the time. So we are in a better position to make our wrong right. That is why the word of God is so important. And the word of God is alive. Through the auspices of the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin. And don't fool ourselves. If when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and we play the fool, we get judged just like we get in the Old Testament. Nobody might be stoning us. Have you ever heard, well I say from time to time, that when I sin, Sometimes I'm better off being caught by people and then I have to just make my wrongs right than being chastised by the Holy Spirit. And so I believe that is the merciful part of it is that God, because the writer of the Hebrew tell you, tells us that if we are not chastened, we are bastard. If he does not chastise us, if we are not disciplined, we are bastard, we are not legitimate children. And so um, chastening and chastening as I was pointing out to another group recently chastening for the believer is not always or it's not necessarily for doing wrong because chastening for the believer is not necessarily punishment but it's more child training so we go through the rigors of child training which the Bible writer the Hebrew tells us is not always pleasant makes comparison with our earthly parents chastening us and so we don't like it and so when the Lord chastens us, we don't like it either. But I don't want us to think that when we talk about this age of grace and dispensation of grace or period of grace, whatever we want to call it, we have a tendency to want to think that God is a little more lenient. Like God is a grandparent. You know, grandparent discipline children, right? Grandparent don't discipline their children like all this. Their grandchildren like all the discipline their children, you know. Grandparents are very soft. Sorry, all the grandparents listen to me. I'm, I apologize. But grandparents are very soft. They discipline their children much harder than they discipline their grandchildren. God is no grandfather. God is grandfather to nobody. God is father. So I, I don't want us to think that because what we were just talking about, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Remember those verses? We just strong verses. We can't escape. Now that you have it, you can't escape. The Lord is going to, because he's just and he's holy. He would, be, he would divest himself of his justice if he's soft and sin. He would divest himself of his holiness if he overlooks sin. He wouldn't be holy anymore if you can bribe him. So we have to be very, very careful of that, you know. And, and, and drives us back to the place where we know that we're dealing with the holy God. So the impetus is that we do right. All right. I, I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, Sister Rita, did it? Um, thank you. Yes. All right. Very good. Very good. All right. Um, 
Thank you, Pastor. Is anyone else with a question? I guess we're back. Yes, Pastor. Sister Jenny, go right ahead with your question. Sir, little one here. Mm -hmm. Pastor Williams. Yes, my dear. Sorry, Pastor. Pastor. Why did Paul say we were cursed if we focus on the law? I think James said the law was a mirror to Galatians and Romans. Why this whole, sorry, something, I missed one little thing. Why this whole lot? Why did Paul said we were cursed if we focus on the law? Okay, there was something that I had intended to say when Pastor Hutchinson, or even when, um, Pastor, oh. <laughs> when Pastor Anthony was talking. Oh. That if we, if when we study the book of Hebrews, if we understand that the, the writer of the Hebrews is constantly moving from place to place, making comparison between God's three firstborn son, the one that is referred to as the only begotten son, we know that is Jesus Christ, the one who is already God's firstborn son, according to Exodus 4, um, 22 and 23, God said to Moses, tell fear, let my son go, my firstborn son, and the one that is waiting for the adoption, according to Romans 8, 24. Mm. So comparison is made from place to place. If you have, if you keep that in your mind, it is easy to understand different portions of the book of Hebrews. That came back to my memory because you asked me about Paul. I want to remind you who Paul was. Mm. Before he became Paul, he was a strong purporter of the things of God, you know. Right. Contrary to people's belief. Yeah. When Paul was struck down on the road to Damascus, Paul was a zealous servant of God. Right. His intent was that anybody who deviated from what they understood as the rudiments of the law, anybody that deviated from mm. that was, was just terrible. Mm. And so when Paul went out to persecute what we now know as the church, Paul right. never knew it as the church. You know. Paul knew it as those in the way. Right. Those are the derogatory expression. It was not commending those people to be in the way. It was like a nickname, that, mm -hmm. that old way. Paul later on said, when his name was changed from Saul to Paul, he said, the way that I persecuted, no, I'm a part of that way. Mm -hmm. I'm saying to you, the reason why Paul was so strong, because even though all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, God does not take away these writers, the human writers' personalities, you know. He does not take away their profession. He does not take away their personality. He does not take away their circumstances, their geographical location, where they're from, and what their expertise are. Mm -hmm. So when Paul wrote, Paul was writing, and he said it from time to time, as a, as a Jew of Jews that became a Christian. And it's not by chance. He was the one that wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man mean Christ, He's a new creation. And so he was emphasizing his new creation. But he never stopped telling the people when he made comparisons. You talk about Jew, I am more than mm -hmm. them all. And he went mm -hmm. down and gave his resume. I mean, circumcising mm -hmm. the, the, of the tribe of Benjamin, you know. And he went down. But he was talking about, he said, all of that was dung. Filth. Mm -hmm. thing for the excellency of the cross of Christ. So he was saying, even though this is something that is considered great, and by the way, that is why mm -hmm. the Jewish people still think that they are above, are cut above the rest. Mm -hmm. Those of us in the New York area, it's mm -hmm. not wicked. The Jews are wicked. Why they disobey Governor Cuomo and do whatever they want to do? But they think that they are cut above the rest, and so they don't have to follow everybody else's regulation. Of course, they are in blindness and they don't know any better. And uh, we have to. The Bible commands us to love them. They are not always lovely or even lovable. Sorry. The Bible commands us to love them, and so we have to love them. If you don't love the Jewish people, you are just like Cain. You hate your brother. Right. Um, right. So we need to understand that the, the, the law, the law is still a good thing. Mm -hmm. But we have something better. The grace. That is why, if I can give you another Old Testament illustration. You remember mm -hmm. the account of Ruth? When Neuroma yes, came uh, back to, to uh -huh. Bethlehem Judah 
And he, he met the first kinsman. Remember, he met a kinsman that agreed to redeem the inheritance. Yes, yes. Sir. And then when you say, well, when you redeem the inheritance, when you buy back the land, you're going to have yes, to take this more by this girl as your oh. wife. He said, no, 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 no. I can't do that. He was, he was in agreement <laughs> up to that point, you know, when he said, well, you're going to have to take Ruth as your wife. He said, no, no, no. If I do that, I'll mar my inheritance. So that is where boys come, came into the picture. So I want us to understand that it's not that the law is a bad thing. Mm. Something superior. Okay. You have something superior to the law. The grace. Mm. All right. Um the story. Thank you, uh, Pastor, and for answering the question. Thank you, Sister Jenny. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else? Anyone else with a question? All right, um, Pastor Williams? Yes. All right, so let me just show this right here. Is there a distinction between Israel and the church? Oh, definitely. All right, go right ahead. Ever, ever, ever since I'm talking, I'm talking about the two brothers. God deals with two nations. And America is not one of them. Nor Cuba, nor Pakistan. Nor wherever, Venezuela. The nation... Israel, the old nation in Jacob, and the new nation in Jesus. I said Jesus just for alliteration, because more accurately, it's the new nation in Christ. It's not really in Jesus, it's really in Christ. But because I use Jacob, I'm trying to use the two J's for the benefit of you preachers. Um, Israel, Israel as a nation is God's people. Because of their disobedience, then God has set them aside. God is not dealing with them now. Um, where is it? Matthew 21, 43, I think. I will take this kingdom from you and give it to a, a people that will bear the fruit thereof because Israel was not bearing fruit. You know, the account of the fig tree, the Lord was walking down and it was fig season and there was no fruit on the tree. So he cursed the tree. Israel is cursed. And oh, by the way, that's another answer to the question before. The law is cursed. But it does not mean that they are forfeited. Paul started out the book of Romans that way. Has God forsaken his people? And this is one of the few, if any other place, I can't recall any other place where a, neg a double negative is used in the Greek. Has God forsaken his people? No, never. It's a double negative there in the Greek. God has not forsaken his people. They have been set aside. What we refer to as Daniel 78 week, when God continues, some people like to refer to it as God's time clock has been stopped at the 69th week. A lot of people, including some of the prophets that wrote, never realized that between the 69th and the 70th week, there's a long period, the period in which we are now existing. And he's dealing with a new person. No, let me not use the word person. It will show us all. Um... He's dealing, because I was going to say he's dealing with a new man. He's dealing with a new nation. The new nation in Christ. During that, in that interval. And this new nation in Christ, a unique nation, you know. The writer, a Roman, Paul writes and says, we are, we are different. We are grafted in. But we are so different in that usually when you're doing graft, you know anything about horticulture, agriculture, agronomy, you will understand that you graph the bad into the good. Sorry, you graph the good into the bad. If you're going to graph an orange or a citrus plant, you graph the good into the bad. You, you know, when you're grafting an orange, you, you get a store orange and you graph whether you want a nig or you want a navel orange. You graph the good into the bad. Now, we are different. 
Him that is the bad, that is grafting the good, that is why Paul wrote and said, you're not the root. Don't boast. Because you're not the root. Israel is still the root. The fact of the matter is, if you don't understand Israel, you really don't understand your faith. I quoted earlier on, almost the beginning, at the top of the presentation, in Ephesians chapter 2, we were not a people. We were aliens. We were without God. We were without hope. Israel was the people. I read earlier on from Deuteronomy, Israel was chosen of God. He said, I didn't choose you because you're large. I didn't choose you because of it, but I have set my love upon you. That's the choosing of God. That's election. No. Because of their disobedience, God has set them aside. And, 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 and for the sake of time, I won't. But if you read Romans chapter 11 and see all these special things, the special promises, the special position that the new man in Christ now possesses as a result of the love of God. It's just mind-boggling. And then Paul went ahead and write in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Eyes have not seen nor ears heard, nor has it entered in the heart of man the things that God has in store for them that love him. So the, 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 we are different. The church is different from Israel. And there are some people who are trying to... Trying to... Um, Amalgamate the church and Israel is a terrible doctrine that is referred to as the doctrine. replacement theology. And some denominations are worse than others. They are trying to say, We are the spiritual Israel. No, no, no. We are the church. We are the church, a different entity from Israel. Both are God's people, but a different entity. And God is not dealing with both of us at the same time. That is why the church will be raptured before the tribulation begins. Because when the tribulation begins, God is going to be dealing with Israel again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else with a question for Pastor Williams? It's not like I heard somebody who was trying to get on. You want to try again, the person? All right, um, Pastor Williams. Okay. I don't, you, can you hear me, Pastor Williams? Yes, slow down there. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, I just want to make sure. I just thought that for a moment that you um you got disconnected. All right. So, so Pastor Williams, um, you you have a question? Okay, all right. Um, the question, the question that somebody wants to get clarified here, is: At what point in time will the Old Testament saints be raised from the dead? Because it is mentioned, as written here, that the New Testament saints will be raised at a certain point in time, but then. What happened to the Old Testament said? What point in time will they be raised from the dead? I'm going to answer this like a modernist. The modernists, when they don't want to take any strong position, they say there are different schools of thought. I don't want to get into that category. But I honestly believe that the, the Old Testament saints will be raised at the same time. When they, you see, I believe resurrection will be resurrection of saints and resurrection of the wicked dead. So I believe that the Old Testament saints will be raised the same time when the, the saints of this age are raised. All right, so there... I mean, I know that there are people that will differ on that, and I, I'm not going... I want to say I'm not going to be dogmatic and tell anyone that they're wrong if they don't take that position. But... But I believe that saints will be raised with saints. And then the wicked dead will be raised with the wicked dead. So there's an extended question behind that one. So if the, if the Old Testament saints are raised with the church saints, where will they go? Will they accompany the, the church at the Bema Seat Judgment? Or will they, uh, where will they go? You see, that's one of the reasons. Um, it was this past Sunday. Talking about when we 
when we try to put our chronology into the events of things, especially in the Lord's day, because remember when, 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 when the church is raptured, man comes out of the, the man's day into the Lord's day. And if we are going to put chronology in the Lord's day, one of the things that, and if we are going to get to the place where we just see and then we go to the demon seat and then we're going to say one, two, three, and then we go to the marriage of the Lamb. What is that really so? We really don't know. We really don't know. So, so there is going to be a marriage of the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb naturally going to come after the judgment we are. So I can't tell you. I wish I could, but I can't really tell you how that part will work. Because I don't know how I don't know how soon after the rapture you're going to even have the judgment seat of Christ because now you're dealing with the Lord's day now. And the Lord's day is not restricted by time. Remember that God can bring things forward and bring things backward. It came up because I was trying to explain that when, when he didn't see something like the church, you know. He saw the church. When he saw the church, he saw you and I in it. Because God wanted to bring him forward. He's something like the kingdom of God, you know. They saw the kingdom of God. Because when you go into the Lord's day, the Lord's day is not restricted by time. God can move forward and backward at his will when it comes to the, the, the day of the Lord. It's just man's day has time. And there was no time before man came on the scene and it is just to give us an understanding so let us I don't know I can't tell you that I can tell you exactly what is going to happen to Old Testament saints but I believe Old Testament saints will be a part of the feast where God is going to put them I wish I could tell you I don't know all right. Thank you, Pastor. Anyone else with a question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear Anyone else with a question for Pastor Williams? Just unmute your mic. And... I have one. All right, go ahead, Pastor Richardson. Right ahead. We can hear you loud and clear. So um, you just asked uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask earlier. But... Um, I was referring to First Peter three um, to answer um, that question, but now that he just answered, um, Pastor William just answered that question. Uh, first, first Peter three t um, tells us that Jesus went down into um, hell and spoke and preached to the um, the people during Noah's time who did not heed to Noah's warning then. My question now would be, at what point will those people be judged or if they will be, or if I'm, I'm, I am thinking that he went there to preach to them, to give them an opportunity. Okay. So at what point will those people be judged and will those people then who accepted will be saved? All right. Because that's pretty confusing to me. All right. So I'm going to let Pastor, but before we jump to Pastor, just remember that it is the word spirit that is in reference to those people. But I'm turning it over to Pastor William. He's the guest. Okay. Pastor William. Um, remember that... Remember that some Old Testament saints came out of the grave at the resurrection of Christ. Some came out at the resurrection of Lazarus too. But I have a feeling that some of these people died again. Like I have a feeling that Lazarus died again. Um, but like I said, we... 
Pastor Hodgson just made a reference to First Peter, but in Second Peter chapter two, where it says, "God spared not the angel that sinned and cast them down to hell," and that hell there is Tartarus, some wicked angels that are kept in chain. And I believe that when the Lord visited the underworld, he, he went there to tell these angels, these wicked angels, something. Because I believe the reason why these wicked angels are kept in chains, these are the Nephilim. These are the Nephilims that, that were trying to thwart God's plan. Sons of God that cohabited with the daughters of men. And if that, if that was the case, the Messiah couldn't come in. Because if, if he had messed up the human race, the Messiah couldn't come in the form of man. So these angels, these, these Nephilims, which I believe they were, um, are chained in, in, in hell. And, and, and I believe, and probably some of it might be speculative, but putting scripture upon scripture, you see, he went there to tell them that, that which you're trying to, to prevent is now accomplished. Man's redeemer, one is now worthy to take the scroll, the scroll of revelation out of the hand of the Lord and open it and redeem the inheritance. Um, I wish, and I don't know, probably later on I might come upon something that will help me to clearer say where and what happened to Old Testament saints. But upon this, to, up to this point, I have to humbly say, I really don't know. Um, what is going to happen to them. But I believe, what I do believe, and I think I have scripture enough to sustain that, is that saints will be raised with saints. And wicked dead will be raised with wicked dead. So the wicked, the wicked of, even recorded in Peter, will be wicked. And the saints, anywhere at all, whether the Old or New Testament, will be saints. As a matter of fact, a scripture as simple as it might sound, a scripture that helped me to come to that conclusion is the scripture that I quoted earlier on from Ephesians chapter 2, where it says, verse 19, where it says, Know your fellow citizens with the saints. So if God amalgamates saints like that, I think we are pretty safe to amalgamate them too. Don't you think? Yeah, um, and also, Pastor Williams, we should remember that when Jesus went down and spoke to the spirits or angels, that his intention was not for them to repent because they just cannot repent. They can repent. Angels can repent. So he, the message that he brought to them was not a message of repentance. It's a, it's a message of authenticity, if you ask me. So see, what you're trying to prevent is done. Mankind is redeemed. The price has been paid. Yeah. Because that was angels' problem, you know. The angels' problem is that God has made a new being, a being that they don't know anything about, that we call human being. This being, so the angels were asking this question, reverberated in Hebrews chapter 2 and, and, and Psalm 8. What is man? You're making him a little lower than us. Man, man can't do it. Man is made a little lower than us. And the writer say you don't see anything yet. This is Jesus. The same way I'm going to exalt man. I'm, I'm going to exalt him to glory. And of course, you know, glory there is talking about regality. Because that is what angels are scared of. That's what they were made for. They were made to rule. And God is now making a new ruler. A successor. And who likes to see a successor? That's why Herod wants to kill off all the baby boys. Right. He doesn't hate baby boys. He just hates successor. All right, we have about five minutes to go. So anyone else with a question? Pastor Hutchinson, were you satisfied to answer your question? Uh, yes. All right, good. Very good. Thanks. Right. Anybody else?
anybody else? Hmm. All right. Just one more question, just one more from anybody. Yes. Um, in the Old Testament, we see where Israel was promised to rule over the Gentile nations in the earthly messianic kingdom. Um, so I'm wondering if um, this uh, promise still stands. Oh, sure. That Israel will rule over the Gentiles in the earthly messianic kingdom. Because in the, in the messianic kingdom, I see Jesus Christ um, ruling with his bride. So I don't understand how Israel will rule at that point over the Gentiles. I'm with you, Pastor Clark. So tell me anybody. Oh no, go right ahead, Pastor Rams. You go right ahead. Okay, come on. One, you remember when Peter? That is exactly what he's talking about. So, of Israel. They should be able to walk on the water. They should be able to walk on the Gentile nations. But the time will come when they will be able to do that. Another thing that we that probably will help us to understand that is that Jesus Christ will have dual rule. That is why if you look at Old Testament again, and that's why it's so important to use the Old Testament to understand the new or new, use the new to understand the old. When Moses left his family to go back to Egypt, he did not abandon, he did not abandon his family, you know, in Midian. As a matter of fact, if you read that account, you will notice that Zipporah went pathway with him. And then Zipporah's father went back for them. Came a time when so, so even though the Lord Jesus will be ruling on the throne of David, and the Bible tells you that in Acts, that Jesus Christ will be the one that will be ruling um, on the throne of David. It's not, um, let me see, in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, verse 30, he said, Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has so with an oath to them that on the, of the loin according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne so Christ is going to sit on the throne of David so, but salvation had to be through Jesus Christ can be true, Buddha. As Jesus Christ, it had to be a Jew that would rule over the earth. And so when Jesus Christ come, he, Jesus Christ, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 30, is of the line of David. Because some of the Jewish people thought that David was going to be resurrected and come rule again. No, no, he says Christ, somebody from the line that's come out of his lineage that will come back and rule. So even though he's ruling on his throne, and by the way, in Jerusalem, and that Jerusalem is not where you are, as some people will try to tell you, and Judea is the next town down the road. He's talking about Jerusalem in the Middle East. That's why they're going to reestablish the city of Jerusalem. Now all sorts of talk, and I don't want to take up your time. You can stop me, Pastor Clark. I don't want to go over your time. But all sorts of talk are out there now about how Christians are being helpful to help to repatriate the Jews to Jerusalem and how, how um, 
the, the capital of Jerusalem is uh, capital of Israel is moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and all these nice things and whatever. Listen, any Christian that is helping a Jew now to repatriate to Jerusalem is an affront to God. Because according to God, according to the word of God, Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn to hell, God has promised them a land. And God has promised them more land than they are fighting for. God, God is going to give them much more than that. But God said that my people must repent before I give them the land. As a matter of fact, in, 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 in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18, and I just read the B part for the sake of time, it says, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. I can go on to read in chapter 17 and verse 8, and you see some more. And I'm saying to us that God is going to give Israel more land than they're fighting for. But according to God, the land is contingent upon repentance. Israel has not yet repented. So Israel don't belong in the land. God is permitting it. But they will be driven out of the land. Every one of them will be driven out. There's going to be a bloodbath in Jerusalem. Before God give it to them. Because if you notice in scripture, Israel never repent in the land. You know, They never repent. They always repent when they're outside of the land. So their repentance is not going to take place in Israel. So all of those people who think so, they can think again. I just want you to understand that if you understand God's um, gradation of power, how he reigns, how he, how he rules, there's a gradation of rulership. I can't elaborate on it too much now for, for the sake of time, but I want you to remember in Daniel, um, when Daniel's prayer was hindered, uh, Michael was unleashed to, to resist the evil one. But I want you to notice that there was a prince of Persia because the Jewish people were under the domain of Persia at the time. So the prince of Persia is the angelic, the demonic ruler of Persia over the nation of Persia. So all of these countries, all of these people, all of these nations, including America, Jamaica, wherever, they do have a demonic entourage in the heavenly realm under Satan. And so we need to accept Israel. Israel's, Israel's angel or Israel's Israel's angel is Michael. Uh, but Israel is in disobedience, so they fall in the same category. But we all we are all under demonic directive, if you want to say. But they all fall under God because God is sovereign and God allows it. And one of these days, God is going to stop it, according to the writer, when God becomes all in all. So um, Jesus Christ is going to reign on the throne of David as well as reigning from his heavenly throne where his bride will be at that time. Just look at Moses. Moses having left, Moses still had a home where his wife and sons were. But he was gone to Egypt to deal with it. When Jesus Christ leaves to come back to the throne of David and, and, and in the city of Jerusalem, which is New Jerusalem, um, he's going to still have his throne in heaven where his bride will be at that time. All right. All right. Thank you, Sister Moore, for that last question. And Pastor Williams, on behalf of all of us here tonight, we just want to thank you for being our guest as usual and for your faithfulness and commitment to the Word of God. Thank you, Pastor Williams, for being You're most welcome. It's my privilege. It's an honor to serve in this way. Amen. Amen. I want to thank everyone for being a part of our discussion tonight. What a wonderful year it has been. God has been a good God, has kept us, and we're looking forward for God's leadership in our lives as we trust in him for the coming year. Tomorrow night, we are going to begin at 10 o'clock, as we mentioned, and we will not be meeting in person here. We are going to be doing it by way of Zoom. And you'll be privileged, just like any other time, to share your testimony. So we're going to start at 10, some wonderful uh, songs. And in between the songs, you will be able to share your testimony, what God has done in your life uh, during the year, and so on. And then 
Um, I'll share a word of encouragement with you and we'll let you go. We're not going to be meeting to uh, count the clock down. That's not what we're going to be doing as believers. We're just meeting to thank the Lord for what he has done for us and to uh, seek his face as we embark upon the coming year. So tonight again, let me thank you and I look forward in hearing your voices tomorrow uh, starting at 10 p.m. in the afternoon. Blessings on everyone and I hope and trust that you will get a good night's rest. Let's pray. Our Father, we are indeed grateful for the study tonight and coming to the very last Wednesday of the year. What a blessing, what a privilege. Who knows that we would have lived to have seen tonight. As mentioned early on in our prayer, that there were many who started out with us and today they are not here, they are gone. Father, we pray that you will take our hands and lead us in the paths of righteousness for your very name's sake. We thank you for Pastor Williams and we thank you for the ability that you've given to him and we pray that you'll continue to use him to your glory. Father, we pray that you'll lead the way for the coming year and we pray that we will put our full trust and faith in you and that we will daily apply your words to our lives as we live, almighty God, for you. Thank you again for tonight. We ask your blessings as we go. In Jesus, our Savior's precious name. Amen and amen. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of tonight's uh, study again. And thanks again to Pastor Williams. Blessings on you all. Bye-bye. I will be hearing from you tomorrow night as usual. Bye-bye. Oh, but now.